Well, I'm thankful that you're here today, and we got a lot of big things happening, and I'm, and I'm excited to be able to share this third lesson of the Kingdom Come series. And if you are uh, a note taker in your service guide, there's an opportunity to take some notes, and I always encourage you to do so. And uh, if you want to jump up and down, that's okay. Um, in this series, we've been looking at Christ's words as he teaches us to pray, and and our series text has been found in Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus is teaching what we know today as the Lord's Prayer. He says, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. These are words that we have prayed often, many of us that have grown up around Christianity or even not. It's a commonly known thing. We hear it a lot on movies, at, at funerals and things of that nature, and sometimes weddings. And so there's a lot of connection culturally to these words, but but over the last couple of weeks, I've had people just comment to me that there's more to the words thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, than they may have initially thought. And we've been talking about the fact that his kingdom is eternal, but not alone. Last week, we talked about the fact that his kingdom is your choice. You don't have to choose his kingdom. There are three possible kingdoms. There's the domain of darkness, there's the kingdoms of this world, and then there is the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, which can be used interchangeably. Last week, we discovered that the kingdom, that we as, as individuals, we are residents of earth and citizens of heaven. So we, we live in this, this unique place where we're, we're between the two, where we're, we live here on earth. He hasn't just taken us to heaven the second that we were saved, and yet we are citizens of heaven. He said that we don't belong to this earth any more than he did, and so uh, we're, we're residents here and citizens there. So somehow... The kingdom of heaven is interacting with earth, and I want to talk today about the interaction between the kingdom of heaven and this earth. How, how does heaven interact with earth? Well, the predominant uh, connection between heaven and earth is easily seen as Jesus. Jesus was God made flesh, God on earth, the Son of God walking among us to be the sacrifice for our sins. But as, when he was coming onto the scene, there was somebody going off the scene. The person going off the scene, was his name was John the Baptist, and John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus. That's what Scripture calls him. He was the guy who came along and said, this is the Savior. I'm called to be the, the one who announces him, and, and so now there he is. And, and he literally did that. As Jesus came to be baptized by John, John said, uh, Behold, here comes the Lamb of God. And so he, he, he identifies Jesus as the Savior. But Jesus was talking about John at one point, and he starts describing him. He says, John the Baptist is a strong man. He's a, he's a, a, a great man. In fact, he said he's a great prophet. But outside of being a prophet, none who's lived before are greater than John. He's the greatest until this particular moment. And, and that's a big statement, especially coming from Jesus, that, that you know, it's, he's, a, he's a big deal. He is all that and a bag of very family-sized chips. I mean, he's a big deal. And so here he is uh, describing him, but then he says something different. He says that John the Baptist is great, but the least of those in the kingdom of heaven will be greater than John. And that becomes a confusing statement because if John's all that, and he's the greatest that's ever been, he is the initial goat, and now... Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know what goat was for a long time, but I figured it out, so I'm just going to weave it into everything I ever say. Um, no, I won't. But Jesus is saying he's all of that, and then he's saying, but the least of those in the kingdom of God will be greater than John. So does that mean then that John the Baptist isn't part of the kingdom of God? How can the least that's coming after be greater than the one that already is if the one that already is is so incredibly great? 
We would understand if he said, John the Baptist is only superseded by me being Jesus, but he doesn't say that. And the reason he doesn't say that, and the reason why he could say that those at least in the kingdom are greater than John, is because John the Baptist was not able to see the fulfillment of the new, the new covenant, the, what we call the New Testament, or the new covenant that was coming forward through Jesus Christ. He wasn't able to see the fruition of salvation, salvation by grace through faith where the Holy Spirit would infill the believer and suddenly the power of heaven was available on a level that it had never been available before. Jesus preached the kingdom of God is here, but he also was the one who John the Baptist baptized and then the scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus at that particular moment. The Holy Spirit had never descended upon John the Baptist in that same way. In fact, from that point until the Acts chapter 2 and then onward into the early church and even today, when you become a believer in Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit begins empowering your life and suddenly Jesus could preach the kingdom of God is here when John the Baptist could only say the kingdom of God is near. So those who have been empowered by the Holy Spirit become greater than John in what John could accomplish in the kingdom of God. And so Jesus transitions from talking about John and starts talking about how heaven interacts with earth and the interplay between the two. And he says in Matthew chapter 11, verse number 12, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent and violent men take it by force. Now, this is a, a passage that we don't talk about very often, and, and it's a violent passage. It's a, it's a passage that in, indicates that there is a, a wrestling, a warfare, if you will, between the kingdom of heaven and, and other kingdoms and the kingdoms of this earth and the domain of darkness. There is a, there is a, a, a violence that is happening there. But when we read this, we often read it from the standpoint of the kingdom of heaven is being attacked violently by violent men. And so we must defend the kingdom of heaven. And that, that is a, a correct way. You can read it, the scripture that way. But it is also, it can also be read very differently because the word suffers, that word has changed in its meaning over the years. Historically, the primary use of the word suffers would be something that was advanced upon or, or pushed upon. In fact, if you look at the Greek word there, it, it means to force or to crowd oneself onto or into another or into a situation. One could say easily that I suffered violence upon them. Or if you wanted to threaten someone, I'm about to suffer violence upon you. That would be an accurate use of the word. It's also accurate to say that it means to be seized or pressed. So I could say I suffered violence from you. Both are equally true, but if you look at how the kingdom of heaven is positioned scripturally against every other kingdom, the scripture describes the kingdoms of hell. It says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What's it? It's talking about the kingdom of heaven. So the kingdom of heaven is not on defense in this situation. The kingdom of heaven is on offense in this situation. The kingdom of heaven is moving forward. It's not something that is shrinking back. In fact, Christianity is often viewed as soft and, and, and wimpy and, and kind of placid. In fact, uh, many people describe Christians as those who are kind of weak-minded, needing a crutch to make it through life. And so you just need to hold on to a fantasy of what it may be and what it could be and what it might be. And I will tell you, that is patently false in every single aspect. Because the kingdom of heaven is not weak, nor is it soft or placid, and neither is the believer any of those things. In fact, the kingdom of heaven is a powerful unstoppable, unrelenting, and undeniably victorious invading force. In fact, it, is, it exerts absolute authority over the domain of darkness. 
There is no way that the domain of darkness can stop the kingdom of God. They tried. They tried to kill Jesus. In fact, they planned to kill Jesus. They tried to kill Jesus, and they succeeded killing Jesus. But what they didn't understand is that in killing Jesus, they were simply fulfilling the will of the Father. They welcomed their own destruction with their plan. The kingdom of God is completely unaffected by the kingdoms of this world. I told you recently that in China they're saying maybe that's the largest group of Christians in the world, and yet it's a, a country that, that consistently persecutes Christians. I have a great story, testimony to tell you next week regarding uh, something to do with that. I can't, I can't wait to tell it to you, but I have to. I, I really do. That isn't a plan or a ploy, although it's a good one. So you might say, well, why then, why then isn't everybody a Christian if, if the kingdom of God is all of these things? The one reason that every knee has not yet bowed and every tongue has not yet confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father is because God desires humanity to choose him freely. And God is fighting for your heart. He's fighting for my heart. So when we, when we pray... When we choose to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it is not a good sleepy time, good night prayer. It is a declaration of war. A declaration of war on the domain of darkness and the kingdoms of this earth. It's a declaration of war against the carnal nature against everything that, that hell and all the demonic forces would like to perpetrate in your life, in mine, in your house, in mine, and in our world. It's an absolute declaration of war. And our big idea today is this. The kingdom of heaven is violently invading the earth. And you might say, well, wow, that, that seems violent. And it is. You might say, I, I don't think about the kingdom of God that way. I, I think, you know, I, I just, I just want to go to heaven when I die, and I want, I want to live a peaceful, joyful, wonderful life. And you can live a peaceful, joyful, wonderful life, and you can go to heaven when you die. But that does not mean that, that the kingdom of heaven it is just a peaceful, joyful, wonderful place. It is for the believer who's living in the kingdom, but it is not for the world around it. In fact, I have three thoughts for us today, which might surprise you. <laughs> and thought number one is this, the kingdom of heaven is a disruptive force on earth. It's always been a disruptive force on earth. From the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1, when scripture is talking about creation, it says that the spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep or of the waters. And, and, and in that, it's not talking about just this little dove flapping its wings having no effect on anything. It's talking about the Spirit of God hovering, moving, transitioning, flowing over the potential that was there. And, and, and it was moving, and it was transitioning, and it is from this moving that we see creation, however any of that occurred. That's how we see it happening. It happened because the Spirit of God was moving and, and, and disrupting. Creative disruption was going on in the kingdom of heaven on to earth. It was, he was imposing his will on earth. And then when humanity rebelled, God became aggressive about getting us back. He wasn't passive about getting us back. He was aggressive about it. He went after us. And I, and I think from Adam and Eve's perspective, and this is just my thought, I, don't, I can't back this up scripturally, uh, really, uh, but it, it's how I think about it. I think that Adam and Eve just believed that, yeah, that's what God said, but I'm going to go ahead and just do it anyway, and, and we're going to make this decision, and I don't think anything's really going to change. We're going to keep living in the garden. We're going to keep doing what we do. God's going to still be there, and you know, the only thing that's going to change is I'm going to be much wiser, and I'm going to know good from evil, and, and you know, it's all going to be good for me, and nothing else will change. And, and I see that kind of like children that are raised up in a, in a particular home or to a particular family. It's the only family that they know. It's the only house that they know. They don't know what it means to be in another house. So the things that they have, they simply take for granted. They can't imagine anything else being the case. And then we know that when a child leaves the house, suddenly their eyes are opened 
and they recognize, whoa, things are a little different than I anticipated. You know, when I get up in the morning and I open up the fridge, it isn't magically that there's a gallon of milk there for me to be able to use the entire gallon in one bowl of, of, of... maybe that doesn't happen in your household. <laughs> I've walked down before and my son has, both of them at one point or another have used the serving dishes for their cereal bowls. You realize that you could have gone and paid for all of us to go to breakfast on what you're eating right there, right? (laughs) Adam and Eve, that's all they knew, and so here they are moving, making decisions for themselves, and God disrupts their actions and their thoughts, and he says, no, 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 no. If you're going to be in the kingdom of God, you have to be submitted to the king. And it's a disruptive move. The instant we started walking away from God, he began calling us back. And his, his plan is violently disruptive to the kingdom of darkness and the kingdoms of this world. Even from the standpoint of who he used and how he used them. There were many powerful forces on the, in the earth and many kingdoms in the earth. Whenever God looked at the earth and said, I'm going to use this man called Abram. I'm going to call Abram out from his country and from his kindred and from his father's house, and I'm going to, I'm going to lead him to a new place. And so Abram comes out, and, and he's the least likely because I'm going to make him a great nation. God, do you know that he and his wife have been trying to have kids for a long time, and they've never succeeded? They don't have any children. Do you know, God, that, that he doesn't come from a, a, a big family? Do you know, God, that by separating him from the family that he has, you're making him even smaller? Do you know, God? And God does bring him out and changes his name from Abram to Abraham and her name from Sarai to Sarah. And he says, you're going to be a great nation. And in time, they have one child by promise. But God establishes Abraham. And then God establishes their son Isaac. And then God establishes their son Jacob. And then Jacob, he changes his name to Israel. And he said, I'm going to make a nation out of you. And we have the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel. And then Israel becomes a nation. And and it's like, wow, God, you did amazing things. But let's remember. Let's remember by, by the logical understanding of earth. It didn't make sense to call this guy. And then number two... You're going to make them a great nation. Well, Israel has consistently been pushed against. From the day that they were called by God to be a called out people for the name of Jehovah, they were pushed against. In fact, they've been, they've been, uh, they have been ruled by, by kingdoms throughout history. They were dominated by Egypt. They were dominated by Assyria, then by Babylon, then by Persia, then the Greeks, then the Romans, then the Turks, then the Ottoman Empire, and then the Palestinians. But today, Assyria is no more. The Babylonian Empire is gone. The Persian Empire has dissipated. The Roman Empire is no more. The Ottoman Empire has faded. The the, the Persians who ruled the area are now no longer the power that they used to be. And yet Israel remains. And they they remain as a powerful nation. They remain as a wealthy nation. They remain as a militarily powerful nation. They should have been wiped out many times, and yet the hand of God has protected them and covered them because of a promise that he made their great, 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 great grandfather, Abraham. It didn't make sense to the world, but God was invading earth through this man. He did it again through Jesus, as Mary has a baby. And it seems like, what's the big deal about this baby? In fact, Jesus is often portrayed in in media as this wide-eyed, kind of soft-spoken, barely there individual whose eyes are really wide and kind of glassy and he can't quite get his thoughts together. And when he does, he speaks in riddles that nobody understands. But that's not true. In fact, the scripture says in Isaiah that nothing was beautiful or majestic about him. Mary did not give birth to a model, but to a warrior. The whole point is that he was was here to do something. He had a purpose. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 8 said, The Son of God appeared for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil. His whole point was to destroy what the enemy had going on. The world didn't recognize him. 
and the kingdom of darkness, the domain of darkness wanted to destroy him. But heaven forced its way into earth. The kingdom of heaven suffered violence upon its enemies in a way from which they have never truly recovered and they will never recover. His will will be done on earth. And the kingdom of heaven continues to expand as one person after another accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and begins walking in his plan and the will of the Father is extended here on earth. But when we think about the kingdom of heaven, nothing about it really is just, is just uh, soft and fuzzy. In fact, salvation itself is bu- brutal. We think about salvation as, as being beautiful, and it is, but it's beautiful and brutal. In fact, thought number two is your salvation was paid in blood. And we don't like to think about that. But when we say the word salvation, it's the word deliverance. And deliverance also means sacrifice. There's always sacrifice with deliverance. Jesus went to a cross. He he was whipped beyond recognition. A crown of thorns was placed upon his head. Then he, the tool of his own death was put upon his back and he carried it to that hill called Calvary. The kingdoms of this world, the domain of darkness, nailed him to a cross, planning for him to die. And he did die. It's just their plan backfired. They just didn't know it was his plan all along. They couldn't understand how it would work. But it was the battle to deliver you. It was the battle to deliver me. The humanity of Jesus submitting himself to the will of the Father. See, that's what he was crying when he said, not my will, but thy be done. That's what he was teaching us when he said, the will of God be done here on earth as it is in heaven. It meant going to the cross. But that was God opening doors of the prison that held you and I captive. We were bound by sin and death. We were captives to those things. And God said, ha, here's the door. I'm swinging it open. And if you want to walk through it, whosoever will. Anybody that wants to make me their Lord and Savior can walk out of that door anytime that they choose me. But it, it, it meant something from you and for me too. See, we, we, we think about the idea of, of salvation as this beautiful, peaceful little moment when we're like, okay, God, I love you. You love me. We're a happy family, and, I'm, and I, you know, I want to follow you now, and so we're, we're cool right now. Yeah, yeah we're good, and, um, and thank you, Lord. I get to go to heaven, and, and, and I, thank you, I thank the Lord that all of those things are actually true, but it goes a little bit beyond that. In, in, in the natural, what's going on may look very much like what I just portrayed, but in the spiritual, there's nothing peaceful or harmonious about it because you and I, we're walking in lockstep with the domain of darkness and the kingdoms of this world. They, they feed our carnal nature. They speak to what we naturally desire. They, they push the things toward us that we want, and our carnal nature is loving every minute of it. We don't want a Savior. We don't need a Savior. But as we're walking along with the kingdoms of darkness and with the kingdoms of this world, and we're just doing things the way the world does stuff, we hear the, the voice of heaven saying, repent. John the Baptist said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. And we hear the words repent and, and, and we, we think, okay, I'm, I'm going to repent. I see that I need a savior. I, I, it, it, my eyes are now open and I can understand what it is that I'm walking in. And I, I need a savior. And so we cry out to him, Lord, I, I receive you. I, it saved me. And that's a beautiful thing in, in what we can see in the expression of that. But what it is in the spirit is it's, it's us ripping ourselves out of the domain of darkness and the kingdoms of this world. It means separating from them entirely and us starting to walk. Everybody else is walking this way and we're walking that way. The world and and the the domain of darkness is walking away from him and we are walking toward him. And this is not a peaceful, simple, easy thing. It's everything except peaceful, simple, and easy. It's war. It's war. It's war. We're dying to self and carnal desires and personal ambition. Last week we said when you got saved, it wasn't that who you were got better. It's that who you were died. It was destroyed. There's there's nothing peaceful or simple or easy about that. It's war. 
Blood was shed to give you the opportunity. And heaven expands on earth as one more person applies the blood of Calvary to their life and walks free from sin and death. Oh, praise God. But no matter how you look at it, salvation isn't a peaceful, calm thing. It's a battle. So how do you and I play into this? Thought number three, you are a warrior for the kingdom of heaven. There are no bystanders in the kingdom of heaven. There's nobody looking on going, great job. There's, there's nobody able to say, I, I, you know, I just, I just don't want to, I don't want to fight. You are fighting. You have a purpose and you have a mission from the king. And every time we surrender our will, we assert his will. Every time we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're, we're diminishing me and releasing him. Some of you in this room right now, this, you're in the middle of this fasting and prayer time that we're in. And you were like, oh, this is good. I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going I'm to read my Bible and do my journaling. and It's a beautiful devotion time with Jesus. And then... And then I'm going to walk through my day just focused on him. And it's going to be wonderful and peaceful. And what you've discovered is all hell has broken loose in your house. And on top of that, you're hungry and irritated. And you don't want to get up in the morning. And so you're like, it's 1230 at night. I'm going to do yesterday's devotion right now in 10 minutes. It's war. Because the enemy is pushing against you as you are pushing against the domain of darkness. You're pushing against the kingdoms of this world. You're pushing against carnality and you're asserting his will. See, human interaction requires compromise. And we think, well... I don't wanna, I don't wanna make my, my friends mad or my neighbor mad or 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 though you know my, my relatives mad. I, I want everything to be nice and, and maybe you're trying to live out a nice Christianity and kind of a go along to get along mentality. But here's the reality: we're not here to make nice, we're here to make a difference. So what does that mean? Does that mean that I have to be mad, you know, have a problem with my neighbor and, and have an issue with all of my relatives? And does that mean that I'm at war with everybody? No, because we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. So he is not my problem. She is not my enemy. The, they are not the, the difficulty. It's whatever spiritual issue that is going on between us or within their life or within my life that I have to battle. And so I don't come against them. I don't come against them with angry words. I don't come against them with negative attitudes. I don't come with them uh, with them with arguments. I'm, I'm not trying to out-politic them. I'm not out trying to out-reason them. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to out-pray them them. I'm trying to outpraise them. I'm, I'm trying to submit myself to him so that he can be glorified. And if God be lifted, if Christ be lifted up, he will draw all men unto himself and the kingdom of God will push throughout the earth. It's not a natural war. Our weapons are the scripture. The Bible calls it the sword that we use to fight with. Prayer praise, personal decisions with actions, following. Outside, the battle is with the darkness and with the world. But inside, it's on our own hearts. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. All right, so what does it look like? What are the enemies that we're fighting? We destroy arguments. Arguments destroy families. Arguments destroy relationships. Arguments destroy neighborhoods. Arguments destroy, destroy countries. 
We destroy every lofty opinion. Not in this service, but in other services, people have opinions. And a lofty opinion is one of those opinions that we say, this is right, you're wrong, I'm right, it's going to be my way. And these lofty opinions, he goes on to say, they are raised up against the knowledge of God. Romans tells us that they, did, they knew God, they did not acknowledge God, they were vain in their imaginations. And so they denied that God ever existed. Not because they didn't know, just because their lofty opinions got in their way. And he says, we take hold of every thought. We make it captive to obey Christ. Now, now, nothing about that is easy. Nothing about that is simple. Nothing about that is calm. All, all of that is warfare. All of it is strong. And there is no crutch for weak people involved. Christianity isn't a country club, it's a battlefield. And maybe you've pulled back from the battle and negativity has overwhelmed you. You've compromised with sin. Some of you have said, God will understand. He does not understand. There is no compromise in the kingdom of heaven with anything that's outside of the will of God. Maybe addictions are controlling you. You say, I can quit any time, then quit. Maybe attitudes. What do you need to destroy today? What do you need to stand up against in order to raise your kids differently than the world says that they have to be raised or, or to stay engaged in ministry or to control your own self and the lust thereof? The kingdom of heaven is violently invading the earth and you are part of the invading force and, and you might be saying, yes, pastor, and I, I, just, I just hope, I hope my family works out okay. I hope that the business works out okay. I hope, don't hope, fight. Fight. Fight for your business. Fight for your coworkers. Fight for your family. Fight for your community. Fight for your church. Fight for your children. Fight for your spouse. Fight for yourself. Fight and let God empower you with his Holy Spirit. I don't know what you're battling. I'm out of time. But just bow your heads with me right now and the Holy Spirit, just speak to our hearts. Maybe there's a mom in here battling with what they should allow or not allow in their home and with their children. Maybe there's a father who's, or a, a husband who's saying, I, I don't know if, if that, sh that should be something that I should draw the line here or not. And is that a battle worth fighting? And I pray for wisdom right now in Jesus' name. Maybe there's a business owner trying to figure out how best to utilize their business for the kingdom, but it doesn't seem to be working out the way that they thought. And, 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 and you're calling them to a battle, but it, it just really would be easier to step away from that battle. It'd be easier for us to be angry at people that disagree with us politically and make decisions that we don't appreciate or, 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 or find value in. But you're not calling us, you're not calling us to win a political war. You're calling us to win a spiritual battle where the kingdom of heaven pushes forward in this earth. It's bigger than politics. whatever you're calling us to, Jesus, we're responding. You've called us warriors. Today, we report for duty. Let your name be glorified. Let your kingdom expand in this earth. Strengthen your people. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. 
stand at our feet this morning. Our prayer partners are coming forward. We're going to sing this chorus. And I'm going to ask you just to worship the Lord. If you need prayer for anything at all, come forward and let us pray with you today and see what God will do in your life.